You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The big banks, without a shadow of a doubt, run the world. Um, they could see me as a problem because how dare I want to give the best rate of interest to granny and then lend to people who can't borrow and give the profit away, you know. I'm a terrible person, obviously. Fred the Shred lost billions, but um, let's put Dave in prison. That sounds a good idea. It's not where you start in life, it's where you finish that counts. And if you can go from builder's labourer at 16 to building the first new high street bank for 120 years in Britain and Netflix make a Hollywood movie about your life that hits number one, then that's a bonkers life. Now you never know when a phone call is going to change your life. And you never know when that opportunity is going to come. But when it does, everybody out there, you need to grab it with both hands. Because them opportunities don't come every day, every week, or even every year. But when they do, grab it. When you feel that sort of stress, the best thing to do is do something. Were you ever worried that they came and shut you down? Because these are big corporations that don't fuck about. If you make enough noise, I'm not saying kill you off, but it is, this is the kind of stuff you're dealing with. If you're ruffling the feathers of people who are making billions, trillions, and you're coming in with an idea that could change the game, they make less money, you're a threat. Did you ever worry about that? No. How much a threat you'd become? No. I don't think you can... You can't be scared. You've got to hit it hard every day. And I'm frightened of nothing and no one. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got David F Fishwick. Oh, yeah. How are you, my brother? Fabulous. Good to see you. Living the dream. Watch Bank of Dave. Great. Bit of comedy, bit of love, bit of just motivation as well. That good understanding. We're living in a world where people are all out for themselves. You seem one of the good guys. You seem one of the ones who actually want to help people, which is an amazing thing to see that. You're going up against the big wigs though, and I don't think what has not, not been a bank, a new bank in over a hundred years here. Yeah. And you want to be one of the first to do so, so fingers crossed. But it's out on Netflix, I don't want to give too much away. It's been a smash hit, was it number one I believe? It is, yeah. But watching that and then meeting you, the, the, he played that part to fucking perfection because it's a great part he's played. Now I know your character, like you can see the bubbly, happy guy trying to do things right, but first and foremost, how are you? I'm fabulous. Life's gone bonkers. But I mean, Rory, you're absolutely right. Rory Kinnear, he plays me better than I do. <laughs> he looks more like me than I do. You know, and when I met him at first, he came up to the house because he needed to do some research, knocked on the door. I opened it. He said, Dave, meet Dave. I thought, you'll do for me. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Before we get into everything, Dave, I always go back to the start of my guess. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I left school at 16 years old, absolutely useless. No qualifications whatsoever. Straight onto a building site as a builder's labourer. Uh, my mum and dad had no money. My mum was a weaver. My dad was a farm labourer. Six in the morning till two in the afternoon. And then at two o'clock, he'd walk down to the local mill and he'd be a tackler there, which is somebody that fixes the looms till 10 at night. He always had two jobs, seven days a week. Mum always worked as well. I never saw my dad from one end to the other. But... Uh, life was hard, but it was good, you know. Uh, I had my brother, my brother's Andrew, older than me. He's a joiner. He can nail bits of wood together like you wouldn't believe. And I'm absolutely useless. So there I were, 16 years old, on a building site, useless. But I loved cars. I wanted to work for myself. I wanted something where I could be proud of, but I had no money. How do you start a business if you've got nothing? And that's what I did. So I thought to myself, well, if I love cars and I want to get involved in cars, but I've no money, what can you do? So I thought, well, I'll go around all the local garages and I'll see if I can find somebody that will lend me one of the old part exchange cars, James. And if I could do it up, clean it up, and then I could sell it and the profit I could keep and the initial money I give back to the guy. So that's what I did. There were a local garage on Bath Street in Nelson that let me take some of the old cars away. I did them up, cleaned them up, sold them. Used to get 20, 30 quid profit, which were a week's wages back then for me as a builder's labourer. 
I was on the YTS scheme, youth training scheme, and you got paid £27.50 a week plus overtime. Uh, I mean, it was over three decades ago, but it doesn't matter. It, it wasn't a lot of money then, and it certainly isn't a great deal of money today. But that's how I got started. How was it without the father figure there, like, to then try and not necessarily be the man, man in the house at such a young age, but did your mum struggle a lot with the dad not being there as well? Well, my mum, she was always working as well, and then she tried to keep the family together. Uh, my dad was always at work, but that was the only way he could make ends meet. I mean, we lived up in a two-up, two-down terraced house in Nelson that was so bad they had to knock it down. But it it uh, it it only had an outside toilet. And back then, I lived on a uh, in a community where I, I, I didn't even know people had inside toilets until I got to about ten. You know, I didn't even know inside toilets existed. Um, and me and my brother, as kids, you know, we, we had no toys or anything, but we used to go on the tip, and the local tip on Southfield Street there in Nelson. And we'd find old bits of wood and old pram wheels and we'd knock old go-karts together and get the string on for the steering. And like I said, he was a brilliant joiner now uh, and a, a real craftsman. But even back then, it, it was good when, when we had an old nail and a, an old rock to bang it in with. And we used to play with the tarmac in between the... Um, in team the rocks and in the ground and the, and the cobbles and we used to warm it up with an old magnifying glass and turn it into plasticine and that's that's what we played with you know it, we had nothing but we didn't know any different mm -hmm. see at that age at 16 having nothing do you think that how did you have the vision to then was there any any self-made millionaires around you did you see anybody successful that you wanted to kind of replicate or be like or was it just something you had inside that you did that you knew there was something more I just, I remember being in a chip shop on Allam Road, that's in Nelson as well, and it's chip shop still there today. I remember being in there, and the, the, I, I asked for a chip butter, and uh, she's cooking the chips, and it was 37 pence with this chip butter, and I put my hand in my pocket, and remember, I was up and down ladders all day with a bucket of cement in each hand, you know, pebble dashing, size of factories and things, proper graft for 27 quid a week. So 37 pence were, were, weren't, a, a small amount of money back then. I put my hand in my pocket, I pulled it out, I, I only had 34 pence, I was 3p short. And I thought, she's cooked the chips, she's put the salt and vinegar on now, I'll just explain to her that, you know, perhaps she could take a handful of chips off the top, uh, because I'm sorry, I'm 3 pence short, knowing that she ain't gonna do that because she's already put the salt and vinegar on. And do you know what she did, James? She took a handful of chips off the top, and I thought, do you know what? I just don't want to be poor. Because I said to her, I said, look, I'm ever so sorry, I just, I'm a few pence short. And she's well, like that, and throw them in the bin. And it was a real turning point. Um, and I remember it today, and I remember the shop today. And if I ever see the shop for sale, I'm going to buy it in Saka. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's just, it, that was a turning point. I thought, I don't want to be poor. I have to do something. And it's not where you start in life, it's where you finish that counts. And if you can go from builder to labourer, at 16 to build in the first new high street bank for 120 years in britain and netflix make a hollywood movie about your life that hits number one then that's a bonkers life yeah. and i've lived it so when you're after the chip shop what was the steps for yourself to then kick on and start to plan something well i wanted to be involved in cars i loved cars i was 16 years old i couldn't even drive a car but i didn't have the price of a gallon of petrol and like i was saying I went around the local garages looking for somebody that would lend me a car, something that they took in part exchange that I could do up, sell, give them the difference. And I found somewhere on Bath Street that let me do that. So I started that process. I started taking the cars away, doing them up, selling them, taking the money back up, keeping the difference until I had enough money where I learned another important lesson where if you've got enough cash up front, you can negotiate better deals. And I went from one car to two cars to three cars to four cars. And that went on for quite a while. I got myself a little car garage with half a dozen old rusty cars on it and did them up, cleaned them up, worked hard and sold them. But I also working at night in the nightclubs as a DJ. Very early in the morning, I'd be on the markets up in Manchester. And these are the markets that open at 3 and 4 a.m. where they sell produce to hotels and shops and uh, all the, uh, the nightclubs. And it's where they get the food from. And everybody there is walking around with a pocket full of cash. So I used to get an old suitcase, a bit like Del Boy. I'd have a load of T-shirts, sweatshirts, tracksuits, shell suits back then. And I used to go around the market 
flogging to the people buying all the produce because they had maybe a couple of hundred quid, three, four, five hundred quid in cash on them. And they'd be buying mushrooms and, and, and things and, and all sorts of veg for the hotels. And if you had a nice T-shirt or a sweatshirt and you were good at selling, you could flog them some up for a fiver or a tenner. So I'd do that until about seven o'clock in the morning where that then short, I'd be straight back to Nelson selling the cars. I'd sell the cars all day. And then just as I was putting the gates on at seven o'clock at night, somebody would turn up for, for one at cars and I'd be writing a receipt from them, counting the cash. And then I'd say to them, look, I'm ever so sorry. I've got to slip into the back of the porter cabin here where I'm going to put my pants and my shirt on. I have another job, you know, so I'd be in the back putting my pants on, combing my hair, I'd a lot more hair then as well. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'd come out, give them the keys for the car, put the gates on the garage, race down the motorway, straight up the steps of the nightclub. Just join us, good evening. Where else could you be? It's a Friday night through a Saturday morning. Get ready for the big one. We're going to take you all the way through. You've got dedication requests. You say it, we'll play it. And that's what I did through then till two in the morning. So I've been working in the nightclub and then straight into the old car, over to Manchester, back on the markets. Three jobs, seven days a week relentless non-stop hard work puts you where some good luck can find you but without hard work i promise you it ain't gonna happen what was the first card you bought for you when you sold them i had an old cavalier with the first one i bought the guy wanted 70 quid returning i advertised it for 100 i sold it for 97 quid i had 27 pound profit with my bad burning maths but that were a week's wage by then so that was the very first car and to be honest I went from car to car to car and I weren't, I didn't want a fancy car. I didn't care about cars. I was more interested then about getting forward. I had this huge amount of drive. You know, I lived, breathed and, and, and ate it. There is no other way. If you've got nothing, there is no other way than pushing forwards relentlessly. So when you were doing the DJing and stuff, were you partying yourself or was it just straight back no, to straight work? Straight back to work. It was always, always about the work. Um, it was always day and night work. Because what happened with the DJing is that money I made DJing, that kept me so I could eat and I could pay me rent. The money from the cars and the markets were money that I could save to then buy another car, another car. And then something happened and I got offered a van. And the guy rang up and I remember it today, it was a red Astromax van. And he said to me, I've got this van for you, Dave. No cars for you this way, but I've got this van for you. And I thought, I don't want a van. What do I want a van for? Full of cement, you know. Have you no cars? No, no. But I thought, do you know what? I'll have a go. And back then, vans were bought in farmyards. Old farmers would sell vans and you'd go up with a pair of wellies on and you'd buy a van. They weren't like these dealerships, or big shiny dealerships there is all over the country today. They were old farmyards with a couple of vans in the corner. So I thought, well, I'll clean this van up, I'll make it look like a car, I'll advertise it for my little car pitch, and then people don't have to stand in all the mud on the farm to buy it. So I advertised it in the auto trader, and back then we had phones about this big, James, and it cost a fortune to ring, but you needed it because you were a deep car dealer and you were never in the office. So I advertised this van, and Thursday morning the auto trader come out, phone call, six o'clock at morning, I'm ringing about the van. I thought, yeah, yeah, van, no problem. Jumped in, got dressed, straight down to the garage, flogged in the van. Another phone call. The van, ringing about the van. Have you any more vans? I thought, vans, that's the future. Get rid of the cars. Let's, let's stick with vans. So I swapped the cars for vans. One van after the other after the other. Got really some momentum there with commercial vehicles. And that was the beginning. A few years gone by, phone call. Minibus. Now you never know when a phone call is going to change your life. And you never know when that opportunity is going to come. But when it does, everybody out there, you need to grab it with both hands. Because them opportunities don't come every day, every week, or even every year. But when they do, grab it. Guy rang me, I've got a minibus for you, Dave. I thought, a minibus, 17, 18 seats. What do I want a minibus for? Have you no vans? No, no. And I thought, go on, I'll have a go. I bought the bus. I scrubbed all the seats up, scrubbed all the inside up, made it look like a car. Advertised it. Guess what? The bus. The bus. I'm ringing about the bus. Wow. And today I'm the largest supplier of minibuses in the country. So you never know when that opportunity comes. It started with just one. Yeah, I had a uh, John who created Reebok. They made the show. It was doing okay. 
somebody who was working on the team designed the aerobic shoe and he says it's a woman's shoe he says we don't know the first thing about aerobics he knocked it he rejected it didn't want it <laughs> and then the guy come back and says please believe me trust me <clears throat> he ended up giving in and they created 200 of them he says we'll try it they sold out in a day oh. and within a year it was a billion dollar idea just it shows. changed the game it took over Nike with the aerobic shoe it went massive in America the material was shit as well they were busting easy but people were just going and buying a new pair they loved them and it changed the game for them unbelievable how that one idea did you know that phone call we'll see when you talk about people it's grabbing that idea because things have happened when I've gone through my journey right now it never felt like that opportunity at that moment but I took the I took the I took the risk and it paid off like was there a moment, did you know that phone call was the game changer or was it just you always willing to take the risk? Just keep going. Calculated risks. That's the, that's the key, calculated risk. If it looks like a good idea, jump in with both feet and grab it because you never know which one's going to work. But if you try a load of them, I promise you one of them will. If you don't try it, then nothing will. You know, if a lad from Burnley with no qualifications who sells buses can build a bank, then anybody can do anything. And that is what I try and, and tell people. Because we went from bus to bus to bus and lots of buses. And then back then you could buy a house in Nelson and Burnley for four or five grand, James. So when I had some spare money, rather than go and buy myself a fancy car, I'd go buy a house. And because I'd been working on the building sites, I know to do a house up. So I'd do it up and rent it out. One after the other after the other. And I've still got a lot of them today. And... You just don't know which one's going to work out for you. But if you, if you get stuck in confidence, self-belief, and nobody's born with confidence, you know, nobody. I was bullied terribly at school. I had to learn to fight back. There's nobody out there that, uh, that, that gets up in the morning and thinks, I'm confident. You've just got to go at it and fake it first. Pretend you're confident. I remember going into car dealership. True story. I've never spoke about this. I remember going into car dealerships when I was a kid and I didn't have the money to buy fancy cars. But back then, everything was bought in cash. So what I did is I took... Let me just uh, use this as an example. Let me use that as an example. So I took newspaper, right? Folded newspaper up and cut it so it was thicker. And then I'd get a few quid. So let's see if... i oh, probably got, still got a few quid on me. Now, so receipts, anything newspaper, whatever you've got, I'm using that as a tissue because we've no newspaper here. And that looks like there's five or six hundred quid there, nearly a grand. And there's a couple of hundred quid. So you'd never get down to the newspaper. You always made sure you were, you were peeling 20s off and always left just one 20 before you got to the newspaper. But fake it until you make it. Because I'd walk in there, look at this, Dave, no problem paying for cars. He can buy any car that uh, that we've got in. Kid Avering, yeah, he's got the money to pay. Boom, 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 boom. Stick the rest of it back in my pocket. And there was just 20 quid left. I'm just hoping it's not 20 quid more or else they find out that there's a, a lot of newspaper there instead of money. How much is winging it in life important? When you've got note, when you start with note and you've got no qualifications and you've got nothing going for you whatsoever, then... There's only one way and that's up. So just keep making it happen. Every day, get up. And it's okay to go to, go to bed at night and think, do you know what, I've made a mistake today. I, 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 why did I do that? You know, and people, it drives people mad. Mistakes is okay. As long as you get up tomorrow morning and you think to yourself, do you know what, I'm going to make sure I don't make that same mistake again. Because the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too strong to be broken. How many hours a day were you working? <sighs> How many hours a day were I sleeping? You know, I was sleeping in the back of the car. I'd come from Manchester in the markets, I'd pull into a motorway car park and I'd have two or three hours sleep. You know, and then I'd drive back to the garage and lift the gates back off. Yeah, I've had Alfie Bairstone, who's a very successful and wealthy man now, but he says the sacrifice that come with the vision, the hustle, to make something of your life, to have that dream, to accomplish everything, the sacrifice of family, friends, loved ones, even kids, how much sacrifice did you put in away from the other stuff that other people think is a normal life, but to then get to the high caliber end of the level you're at, Alfie's at, how much sacrifice comes with that lifestyle? Well, there's a huge amount of sacrifice. You know, you are going to work hard. You know, I'm not going to come on this podcast today and say to you, look, 
there's an easy way we can do this. You know, this is going to be really easy. You know, I'm going to tell you how to do something tomorrow morning and you can get up tomorrow morning and you're going to be rich. That ain't going to happen. You're going to get up tomorrow morning, you're going to get up early and you're going to work really, really hard for the next few years. And then you'll start to see some huge results. And when you start to see results, you can then set yourself some goals. Once you've set them goals, you can set some achievable ones in the interim and then some long-term goals. And then you can reverse engineer how you get to them and then press the sat nav button and set off. What was it like when you made your first million? I've been asked that before and it's an interesting question because I didn't actually see it. Um, there, there wasn't a time when I said, right, okay, that's a million, that's 999,000, tomorrow there's another pound, that's a million. You don't see it like that. You have property, you have land, you have vehicles and you look round and one day you just look round and think, if I add all that up, I've got more than a million quid because things have gone up in price, land's gone up in price. I bought a farm for 130 grand with 10 acres that three and a half, four years later, it was 500,000 quid. I sold it for half a million. So then suddenly you've, 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 you're have you've into half a million and then half a million turns to three quarters of a million and then a, a million. I think, look, it does play a part, but hard work puts you where that good luck can find you. You know, if you work hard, you get a good idea and you keep going at it and you keep trying different things, something will work for you. What was it like with the losses? Losing money or losing money on a vehicle? Like, what, how did, how was that? Did, did you rebound and work harder after that? Because a lot of people now we're living in a very weak generation, I believe now, Dave, and people quit too easy. As soon as they get the first loss, as soon as they hit the first obstacle, they're done. They don't want to go anywhere. How did you handle that? How did you handle rejection? Not having that much money, having to put paper in your money to try and pretend that you had more. Like it's all games and it's just a big fucking game. But it is, it's all a game. How it still is. Yeah. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a bit like Monopoly. Uh -huh. Everything goes back in the box in the end. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you ain't taking it with you. <laughs> How did you handle the rejection or the loss? I remember being at the side of a motorway, right? And I just bought a van from the auction. Um, and I knew, as I knew as soon as I walked towards this, this bus, I thought it's too cheap. It was just too cheap. There's going to be something wrong with it. And I looked through the glass as I walked towards the auction car park. I'd, so, I'd watched it go through, I bought it, but I'd not looked inside. And there it were, the nemesis. It were an automatic gearbox, which doesn't sound that bad. But when these older vehicles back then, an automatic gearbox. You just knew it weren't going to be a good one. You knew it were old and it weren't going to work and it was going to cost thousands to fix. And it will, the gearbox itself would be more than what the bus were. And then you just spent your last three grand on it. So you were driving it back down the motorway, just hoping against hope that it wouldn't be a problem. And there it were. Smoke started coming out, pulling to the side of the motorway. And you sat there with your head in your hands thinking, I've just spent the last three grand on this big four or five ton lump of scrap. <laughs> And people are coming past you and you're just willing, just willing somebody to pull in with a rope and drag you back to the garage because you've got no way of getting back. And you're just hoping and then you just think, you know what, pick yourself up. And there's a lesson that, that we can maybe teach here. Because when you're feeling that sort of stress and there'll be lots of people that, that, that are watching your podcasts all over the world who are suffering stress. When you feel that sort of stress, best thing to do is do something don't just sit there and think do you know what it's stressful it's stressful it's stressful i find that if i just do one thing in other words if i think right i'm going to stand up and i'm going to walk down the hard shoulder of this motorway i'm going to go to a garage i'm going to borrow a rope i'm going to make a phone call i'm then going to get somebody to come i'm going to drag this thing back and i'm going to find a way to sell it and that's what i did but stress goes immediately as soon as you start doing something. If you sit there and think about the stress, it won't go. If you just think, right, I'm going to make a phone call. Just do anything, a tiny, tiny thing. It doesn't matter. You'll feel the stress start to ease off because you started fixing the problem. It's only when you stay in bed or you sit in the chair and you think, ah, oh, oh, shit. The stress, I promise you, will go the minute you make that first phone call or the minute you stand up walk down the hard shoulder, make it happen. So when you started going through the ranks in the, the minibus kind of game and you started, who was your main competitor then? Well, I had loads of competitors. You know, all over the country were competitors. Um, 
I see that as competition. You know, I think competitors is healthy. I used to look up, and you can use this this with any business you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm the mail online uh, business doctor, and I get a lot of people writing into me saying, um, Dave, what do you think about this problem? Or I'm thinking of starting this business, or I want to get into that. And I said to people, look at what your competitors are doing. You know, don't try and reinvent the wheel. It goes around brilliantly. Watch what they're doing and steal the ideas. You know, if, if say for instance, you want to open a pub, go to your local pub that's the busiest. Get a job there at night, working a few hours. Look what beers they sell best. Look what food sells best. Look where they get things from. Look what ent entertainment is the best. What nights is ent entertainment bring you the most tickets? What works best? The, the decor of, of these big organisations will have been done by some architect costing thousands of pounds. Just take pictures of it and, and borrow the ideas and then set up in whatever business you're going to do and you'll find your miles in front of where you were if you hadn't have done that yeah success leaves clues like it's a great to look at other people and go what are they doing like you, you just sense that people are successful you sense that oh they're doing it what is the tools and techniques that they did you read any books or not give it get any knowledge about this or did you just learn it through rawness i just i learned it through making mistakes everything i've done is usually a mistake, you know? And if you don't make mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, you know? And you just watch what's going on around you. If you had a silver bullet and you could fire it at one of your competitors, why would you fire it at him? What's he doing different to you? And why are you doing it better? You know, that is the thing. It just, look what's going on around you. It, the answers are all there for free. You know, these, these big agencies that go out there and they find um, people and they charge you a fortune to bring you somebody from somewhere. All they're doing is nicking somebody from one of your competitors. You could do that yourself on social media. I've got a job. How much do you want? That guy's brilliant. Pay him more than he's getting paid. Treat him well. Look after him how you'd want to be treated if the shoe was on the foot. The guy's never going to leave you. How many, many bosses you got now? Over the years... Um, what have I sold over the years? Tens and tens and tens of thousands over the years, you know, I've sold. But it, the minibus business is a, a small part of what I do now. My biggest business is in America. I have an investment company in America. I've had it for nearly 15 years. Not many people know about it. That's the biggest thing I've got. It started off fairly small and I'm self-taught. There again, if a builder's labourer can teach himself the investment world and build a big business, multi, multi-million dollar business, from just watching and learning than anybody can and that's the biggest business i've got by far see this is what it's all about is to show people that anybody can be anybody they want to be no matter male female no matter some of the most successful people i've interviewed are fucking dyslexic they can't read they can't write just through knowledge and understanding and the main thing ingredient that i've picked up is understanding of people yeah. presentation how they react to people like their people skills has got to be like being a salesman you know yourself your people skills have got to be top notch that like, see when you're going and you've got the mini buses and and you're doing everything now you've got the businesses in america do you ever feel satisfied i've got the bank of dev i've got burnley savings and loans i've got the media company i write books i work for newspapers um i fly planes i've got a plane license i've got a helicopter license um we're now into movies. I make television programs. I've been incredibly lucky. I've been nominated for three BAFTAs. I won two BAFTAs. I've got a Royal Television Society Award. I've six broadcast awards. I have a Sunday Times best-selling book, and I've a number one on Netflix. And not a single one of them I've trained for a single day. I've never been to a business school. And this is the thing about schools and businesses. You know, business teachers teach business to kids and young people, right? I get young people to come up to the local library in Burnley upstairs where nobody knows it's me. They come up and they ask real questions and I answer them. And the thing about business teachers are a lot of them, have, or most of them, 99%, have never actually run a business. It's a bit like getting in an aeroplane with somebody that's read all the books, watched all the DVDs, but never actually took off. If you've done it for real at the call face, you can teach it. And that's something I enjoy doing now. I go and do, talk. I get, paid a fortune to talk around the world at big conferences to, to, to people and that's fine that's work but then I'll go to a school and I'll do it for free because you can get to somebody young enough 
maybe there's a few Daves in there that I can maybe just say, do you know what? If you do this and do that, then that skiving you did or that them them qualifications that you, you, you didn't get, don't worry about it. There's another way. When are you happiest, Dave? Uh, when I'm flying. When I get really fed up, um, like I say, I, I fly a helicopter. I've got a, the jet, jet helicopter at home and when I get really fed up, I'll pull it out of the aircraft hangar and I'll just go and sit on a cloud somewhere by myself. And that's when I'm at my happiest because the helicopter's trying to kill me from the minute I switch it on. I've been flying it for 20 odd years. Um, I've got a big TikTok uh, aviation site. It's the fastest growing aviation site in the world with 50 odd million views. And um, I only did that for a bit of fun. <laughs> and I'm at my happiest when I'm flying. I go up there into the sky and I sit on a cloud and because the thing's trying to kill me, it literally is trying to kill you from the minute you switch it on. Uh, you can't think about anything else. So your mind completely clears of everything. And I, I, I bring the speed of the helicopter to the speed of the cloud. And I almost sit the helicopter onto the cloud. And then I'll drop the collective lever, which then pulls the helicopter down through the cloud. And it like washes everything away. And I, I've been flying for 20 odd years and that never gets old. That's when you're in the present moment, but yeah. now you're like, does your, is that the only time your brain switches off? I've got a brain that, unf unfortunately, it doesn't switch off. It's like a, a Rubik's Cube in your head that's going round and round and round in different directions, and it's trying to fix the Rubik's Cube. So somebody will give me a problem, and I'll fix it in my head, and I won't be able to settle until it's fixed. And I've tried lots and lots of times not to think about things, but it won't, don't, won't work. It won't stop. What it does do is allow you to have lots of things, allows you to have money. It, it gives you lots of benefits, but it gives you a huge downside. You never, ever settle. Unless I'm flying, I'm thinking. Because I asked Alfie, best the question as well, that would you ever retire? And he says, no. He says, why would I? He says, it's pointless. I have known that people who quit smoking or quit drinking and die like two weeks later, a month later. Like my mum's the same, she's non stop worker, like non stop and I don't think she'll ever slow down. I just think it's in her blood. Like do you ever feel that that you'll never stop? I don't think I can stop. Um my dad worked until his very last dying day. Um and uh I remember my dad on the day he passed away, he was in hospital and I was uh, I was sat with him um, and we knew it was bad, you know, he, he knew for a while he was going. And that day I had to do a talk. I'd been booked to do a talk at a, a big place in Manchester in front of thousands of people. And I, I just, I said to my dad, I said, look, dad, I, I said, I'll just have to cancel it. You know, they'll understand you're dying. Uh, and he said, son, go and do your job. Go and do your job, lad. And I went and did it. I went, I went as fast as I could. I did the talk as fast as I could. And I did a proper, you know, I, I did, I did what I needed to do. And I come straight back and he was still with us when I come back and he passed away that night. And that's what, that was my dad. Go and do your job, son. Yeah. You know, and, and that work ethic and that demon drive, it's in you. And if it's in you, it, it can't be released. So it, rather than look at it as a negative, look at it as a positive. Well, do you know now I've got the money I need and I've got all the things that I need and the cars and aircraft and anything I want I've got but what I can do now is I can do things like this with people like yourself um, I can uh, I can build a career now where we can help other people and get them to follow their dreams and have the courage to follow their dreams and if you can give advice and I give for free you know I don't charge anything anywhere for advice uh, the thing I do for the mail online I do for free I do costs, it's the right thing to do. And a lot of wealthy people climb up a tree and pull the ladder up. They're frightened to death of anybody knowing anything. But if you've learned some things throughout your life the hard way, why not pass it on? It don't make any difference to me. You know, my children, one's a frontline police officer, the other one works for animals and um, works with animals. And, you know, they, they have all they need. I have what I need. My wife, I've been together for nearly 30 years. Um, and she was one of those at the beginning when I did break down at the side of the road. She'd be the one in front with a rope and a car dragging me sideways in the snow up a hill to get back, you know. So now we've got all the things we need. Um, why not? Why not make a life about giving back and looking at how you can help other people who want to help themselves? How hard does that look? You've just five minutes ago, you rained off 20 amazing things that you're doing in life. No matter how much money you have, when you lose a loved one, 
How much does that affect you? Immeasurably. Um, but I feel that uh, without that drive from him originally, then I wouldn't be where I am today. So um, I've got two grandchildren now, two boys, um, very young, um, and I can see my dad uh, in in them both, and and one absolutely mirror images him. He's like he's come back to watch, to see what the next chapter was, you know. Uh, so you know what? You never know what's around that next corner, but make sure you're there to open the door to have a look. They must have been proud of you, coming from nothing, being bullied at school, to then being a multi-millionaire, loved by many. Like, they must have been proud. Did you feel that? Or did you, do you ever feel I, I, that you had on, because you're living that life, it might not seem as big as important, I don't know, but when you're doing it, do you, do you get, did you feel the love? Did you feel I'm proud of you? Or was that your dad kind of, because I know dads are strict, but my dad was quite strict, but he'd always, I know he loved us. If he had a couple of beers, he would tell us, he would see the sensitive side. Yeah. But, when you start doing things like it's not that you want to pat the back, but did you did you did you feel the love? No, no. I my, I know my dad loved me. There was no doubt about it. But he wasn't that sort of guy. You know, he was uh, old school. Uh, old school. You get up, you go to work, you provide a, a living for your family, and you put a roof over your head. Um, and he he you know my grand my great grandfather was a rag and bone man. Um, so you know we he don't get any more to, from rags to riches to that. Uh, my uh, my grandfather was in the war, uh, a military. My dad uh, was in the mills and the and the farms, um, and uh, so we've we there were no lawyers, there were no doctors, there were no solicitors, there were no education there. Uh, there were just hard work. How important is it to have a good woman in your in your corner? Because I know now, so you hear masculine energy, feminine energy, and your people say, "Oh, boss lady, boss man," but I believe fat old school morals i believe in a life i believe if you've got the right person behind you who can pick your spirits up when you're feeling down and having those bad days i believe a good partnership that's what it is as well it's not just about loving all the, the fancy shit. relationships are tough if we're, if we're honest enough that like, but how important is that if you've been with your good women 30 years how important is it to have somebody by your side for long to understand you also i think it's probably on a par with the most important thing if you find a soulmate, a partner, and I'm incredibly lucky. Uh, my my Nikki, um, she was a bioscientist, uh, and she cut cancer up for a living. That's what she did, and she's so clever and so smart. Uh, and I don't, as you know, I ain't got qualification to my name. And I was so lucky. I met her in a nightclub, and she came over to me saying I was playing crap records. So I let her look in. My, <laughs> I let her, I let her look in my record box. <laughs> and I don't let. I don't let everybody look in my record box. <laughs> uh, and that's how we met. She'd come up from Wales. She's a Welsh girl. And uh, she'd come up from Wales to Burnley to her sisters. My girlfriend's Welsh. <laughs> Fucking crazy. They're a breed bad. of their own. Crazy bastard. So she has her and her family. I know her mum will be watching this, mate. She's just bad. <laughs> of <her> fucking crackpots. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of got on great. What the Scottish and the Welsh? It's kind of, they're kind of similarities there. Um, but as she will, yeah, you it's, understand the madness. Then. <laughs> it's and and I remember when she came to the garage for the first time. You know when I had that little car garage in Nelson and all them old cars I had. She turned up in this new Citroen, and that were a works car. And I thought, whoa, look at that Citroen diesel, brand new. And I opened the bonnet of this Citroen diesel, and the thing that clinched it for me, it had this big diesel battery. So I got my jump leads out at Porter Cabin and I put my jump leads on this brand new car. She's thinking, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm putting the jump leads on this. And I could jump lead every single car on my car pitch off that diesel battery. Because none of my cars would start. They all had old batteries on. So this Citroen diesel car jump leaded every car. And that's what clinched it. I've told her. That's why I stayed with her. So ladies out there watching this podcast, get yourself a good diesel battery. That's how to get yourself a fella. <laughs> Do you think it's important as well that she was with you before you blew up? Because you know now, man, it's ruthless out there, Dave. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a, I wouldn't like to be out in the wild now because it seems to have changed with social media and stuff. Jack, is it a good thing as well that she knew you for who you were, yes. DJing? Really important because she was there in the dark nights when it's snowing, toying me up hills, rope snapping, me going backwards, 
engine's not running, I'm going down the s bends backwards, and she's panicking like mad, and, you know, it, it, she was there helping when nobody else were. So she's entitled to have the things she's got. She has horses, she has competition horses, she does dressage, but she's still really grounded. You know, I'll come in from somewhere uh, where, like yesterday, I was with Michael Ball, uh, Michael Ball on um, uh, on his uh, radio show, and I was with the guys from Simply Red, and um, I'll I'll go from there. And I was with the Prime Minister last week, uh, and he was talking about me on Prime Minister's Questions, or I'll be with uh, Hugh Bonneville, or uh, all these different people. And I'll come home and I say, Oh, I met so and so, I met so. She'll say, Never mind all that nonsense. Do you want corned beef hash or cottage pie for your tea? And she'll ground you immediately. She don't care about fame. She don't care about money. She don't care about anything. Because she knows if we lost it all tomorrow, that I go to work and I get it back. Yeah, but that's true love then, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's really important. Finding a, a good spouse, finding a good partner is so, so important. And there's another thing that's really important. Communication skills. If you're leaving school, leaving college, wanting to get a different job, Getting the best communication skills you can get is the most important thing in the world. If you can learn to communicate better, you will increase your value by a minimum of 50% and probably 100%. You can go on a Dale Carnegie course. You can learn to be confident. You can fake confidence until you get better at it. But confidence, self-belief, drive and communication and surrounding yourself with good people. If, if, if the people that's watching this today, if you're at school, college, university, working somewhere, whatever you're doing, whatever age you are, look round the room and get yourself a piece of paper and a pencil and write down the people you admire in that room and write down why you admire them. You know, is that person on time? Are they punctual? Do they help out at work? Do they help you with problems? Do they, do they help people? Do they... Do they want to be part of a team? Do they do they come up with ideas? Um, are they just an all-round good egg? And then also look around the room at the people that you don't admire. And what are the things, what are the traits that you don't admire? Are they late all the time? Do they tell lies? Do they do they not want to help out? Are they the last to come to the party? Are they the last to, to throw their their um, their their ideas in the pot? Are they always trying to backstab, you know, and write them things down and then look at the things you admire and do more of those and make sure the ones that you don't admire, make sure you don't have any of those or as little of those as possible. And you will find yourself going towards that. And it really does work. Yeah. How do you find a good team to build? Because you need a team around you to build something major. Like how do you learn? Because that. I wouldn't say I struggle with trust as much as I used to. As I'm getting older, I'm starting to learn. You've got to take more risks and you've got to give people a little bit of trust. And when you actually start doing that, you start learning that people aren't as crooked and bad and as evil as what I first thought. Like you're going to get risks. You're going to get people who take the piss. We get it. But how do you build a good team and network? And how important is it to create some, to have that, to create something special? People are everything. Surround yourself with good people and good things will happen. Surround yourself with the opposite and the opposite will happen, I promise you. Over the years, I've got people that's worked for me who are in the 60s and 70s and I've got people that's worked for me in the 20s. And what I try and do is put them both together. So somebody in the 20s who's fantastic with IT skills and social media skills and computer skills and texting and, and then I'll put them with somebody like old Pete who were in his 70s and uh, he had the best communication skills ever. He'd get somebody to come into his office and they'd sit down and they'd be wanting to buy a bus or a van and they'd, they'd sit down with him and they'd go across the road and I'd get him a, a bacon butty from the cafe and he'd come back and he'd drink tea and he'd be with them nearly an hour talking about everything except a van and a minibus and then he'd be the friend and then he'd find out what they wanted to buy and then if we didn't have it, he'd find it for them and they'd wait for him because everybody wants to buy something from a friend and them communication skills are amazing. So that young guy then gets put with Pete, who can't use a computer. So Pete then learns off the young guy about computer skills. Don't get me wrong, he's never going to be an IT genius, but he starts learning how to email his new friends. <laughs> and then this guy here, or lady, then learns about communication skills. What makes a good salesman? 
long after the price is forgotten, the service will be remembered. Look after people. If you was going to buy that product from them, what would you want? Go above and beyond. It will, it will give you huge dividends. For example, if we sell a bus to somebody and they have a problem, we will go to the end of the earth to fix it. If they're right, you know, they ring up with a good attitude or, you know, we've got a problem, no problem. We will come up there, we will pick it up, we will lend you something, we will fix it, we will bring it back and we will go above and beyond. That's how you get a good name. Go above and beyond. So see when you started becoming successful, see when you started ticking all the boxes, kind of living your dream, how did the Bank of Dave come about? Was that always a plan in your mind? or no. What was the vision behind that? Late 2008, early 2009, my minibus customers were coming to me um, wanting finance for the buses as they had done for many years in the past. And I used to just fill the forms in. My guys had filled the forms in for them. We'd send them off to the local bank or the bank of wherever they lived and we'd get the money for the bus from the bank. They'd take the bus away. Thank you very much. Overnight, the banks just stopped lending. And I thought, have they done something wrong? Have they got a CCJ? Have they not paid a bill? You know, have they moved out without telling anybody? And you know what? They'd not done anything wrong. It was the problem of the high street bank. The banks had just stopped lending. And I thought, well, if they've stopped lending, then either I stop selling buses, which would be a problem. If I believe these people, and I understand what they buy, and of course they do, I built the bus. And I understand what they're going to do with it. They're going to pick kids up in the morning from school. They're maybe going to go and do a stag night that night. They're going to take people to the races. I understand what they're going to do with it. They're going to be able to earn some money to pay me back. So I lent them the money. They paid me back. And I thought, this banking malarkey, it's not that difficult. So then I thought, well, maybe I can help other businesses, not just the bus side of things. So that's what I did. I started to lend to other businesses. And I, and I thought, Ah, this works and that's how it all started that's how i got the idea did you have any guarantees you would get the money back from people was there paperwork was there contracts or was it a handshake well at the very very beginning it was a handshake and then we got paperwork and then we started but surely to put the finance operation together and to start and set it up um but it's it's an incredibly difficult process it costs a fortune the big banks dislike me with a passion because what I wanted to do, James, is I wanted to lend to people who couldn't borrow from the high street bank through no fault of their own. I also wanted to help people get the best rate of interest on the high street. So I thought, if I get granny who's got pension money or have got life savings, I need to make sure that we give them the best rate. We then take that money, lend it to people and businesses who can't borrow from the bank, I stand in the middle and make sure if anybody don't pay, I will take that loan on. And then the profit, we pay the overheads and give the difference to charity. It can't be that difficult, but it's a bloody nightmare to do. It really is really difficult because there's so many people don't want that sort of finance operation. Yeah. When was, because you're not against the big wigs, you're not, I believe personally, you're not against the people who control the world, the people who control the banking system, the big families that... Yeah, but see when you started doing that, like, what was the first obstacle you came to? So the first obstacle really were regulation. The big banks run the regulation. They decide what regulation. They they run the world. The big banks, without a shadow of a doubt, run the world. Um, they could see me as a problem because how dare I want to give the best rate of interest to granny and then lend to people who can't borrow and give the profit away. You know, I'm a terrible person, obviously. Fred the Shred lost billions, but um, let's put Dave in prison. That sounds a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I always knew, I don't know if you remember Coronation Street with Deirdre, Deirdre Barlow, and when Deirdre were got put in prison, it was like free Deirdre. Yeah, those things up in Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Uh, uh, Blackpool, is it yeah, Blackpool Tower? That's right. Yeah. And it'd be like free Dave. Yeah. Because I thought, well, if you're going to do that, get on and do it. Because I've done nothing wrong. And if you've got the moral high ground, they've got nowhere to go. And the press got behind me. They were wonderful. The TV, the media, the press. We made the documentaries. And that's what started me down the, the career of media. Were you ever worried that they came and shut you down? Because these are big corporations that don't fuck about. If you make enough noise, not saying kill you off, but as this is the kind of stuff you're dealing with. If you're ruffling the feathers of people who are making billions, trillions, and you're coming in with an idea that could change the game, they make less money. 
you're a threat. Did you ever worry about that? No. How much a threat you'd become? No, I don't think you can. You can't be scared. You've got to hit it hard every day. And I'm frightened of nothing unknown. Uh, it's just you've got to have the attitude. If you're doing the right thing, then just keep going. Uh, when going through hell, keep going because the minute they have the inkling that you're scared, then they'll just jump all over you. Um, you cannot let them win. If you know you're doing the right thing, then go all the way and you will go further than they will because they're not doing the right thing. They tried to buy me out. You know, one of the big edge funds tried to buy me out. They said, how much money do you want for the place? And I said, well, I don't want to sell it. No, no, we can help you build it into this massive multi hundred million dollar billion thing operation and this, 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 and we can sell it in five years. I said, I don't want to sell it. And they said, well, what's your out? I said, what do you mean out? He said, well, what, you know, when are you going to get rid of it? I said, never. Uh, I said, I want to keep it 100 years. He said, well, you'd be dead. I said, well, I hope not, but I might be. But it's not for sale. And these big banking financial institutions cannot get the fact that I don't want to sell it. It's not for sale at any price. And they just don't get that because they're used to people just writing numbers down and giving them it. Yeah, but people are all out for the money. You seem to be out for the, the kindness, the goodness, and keeping your soul clean, which is whole purpose. Like you say, you can't take it all with you. We're no. all going in the same fucking box. Like, yeah. See, when, like, how does it work? So if somebody came at me and wanted a grand, I give them a grand. Like, is there a certain limit you can get back? Is there a certain minute say, look, I'll give you a grand, give me 1100 back. Like, would that be done for money laundering? Would I get done for... Like, I don't know. How does, how does it work without licenses? Like? You just can't do it. You cannot do it without licenses. I've got loads of licenses for different things that we do. Um, there's a huge sense of th the powers that be don't want you to have a financial institution. I believe community banks are needed, run by the community to benefit the community. You know, they're shutting banks left, right and centre. I mean, this week we've got a bank gone bust this morning and HSBC have given a pound for it this morning. Now, I will double their uh, their offer for that bank today. I'll give two quid for it. But they will not take it. You know, HSBC have just bought out the, uh, the problem bank. But it shows that the problems are still there. They're just as bad as they were before, if not worse now than they were 10 years ago. Nothing's changed. We're going to see a whole world of problems again. And um, uh, the, the one in America that's got sort of tentacles into Britain as well, the, um, the bank that's gone today, um, I just said, you know, if you can buy a bank for a pound, then I should have saved myself 10 years and millions and millions of pounds. It's just a ball. Mm -hmm. But the amount of problems that's in that bank is unbelievable. And this is just scratching the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. Big bankers say that if we don't give them 30, 40, 50 million dollar pound bonuses, then they're going to leave and go back to America. I said to them, get yourself gone. Best place for you. You know, because when you've got kids around the corner, like Burnley Savings Loans Bank of Dave, we've just given to, um, to some kids who've, who've wrote to me saying, but the teacher wrote to me saying, the kids are starving. You know, is there anything you can do, Dave? They're coming to school hungry. You know, we want to buy these big toasting, industrial toasting machines, and we want to buy a lot of food for them. So we bought a year's supply of food for the school, and we bought all these machines, and the kids now are coming to school and eating. But if you've got them on one side of it, and then I've got the food bank there just around the corner from Bank of Dave, um, the church food bank, who cannot get milk from anywhere. They can get cereals from the big supermarkets, but not milk. I bought a year's supply of milk for them. When you've got food banks and schools where kids are coming to school starving, and then you've got these big banks saying that you've got to pay us 30, 40, 50 million or, or you know, we're not going to be able to operate with these sort of people. They're going to disappear. The two scales are so wrong. You cannot have kids starving and then pay somebody 50 million. That's just wrong. Yeah, but greed makes the world go round. It's <sighs> so, so it's wrong. so much greed. Like, even through all the shit with the lockdowns and stuff there, it was the richer got richer and the poorer got poorer. Like, do you see a big recession coming? Do you see darker days coming? I think a recession will come of sorts. It's not going to be as big as people think it's going to be because I think we'll just end up printing our way out of it money-wise. We'll just carry on printing money. Uh, that seems to be the thing that works and paperwork gets moved around and money gets printed. Um, 
I think we need a net for people to fall on. I think if you could provide a net, if you could take something off these big corporate companies like the banks, like the energy companies, you know, people have got two jumpers on and they can't afford to turn the, the, the gas fire on at home. But yet the energy firms are making billions in profits, more than they've ever made before. And I'm not political. I don't care who's in. I'm bipartisan. As long as we're ever going to be in, it's going to do it for the right reasons. Yeah, it's going to do some good. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a crazy game out there that people are struggling. People can't put their heating on. People can't put food on the table. That, uh, Kids are going to school hungry. Yeah, yeah, you know, sad, how does that work? People going to the church for a bag of food. You know, but yet on the other side of the thing, you've got people saying, oh, you're going to have to pay us 30, 40, 50 million. <sighs> you know, yeah, the fuck food, them. The food banks. I like what <laughs> I've done a homeless documentary and with information that we're getting, France were the first ones to force supermarkets and restaurants to give away food to homeless food banks because right now food banks are at an all-time high. People are struggling. There's people with two jobs that still need to go to food banks. That it's just crazy times that we're in. So interest rate for a bank and interest rate for a bank a day, what's the difference? Well, we lend to people who can't borrow. So we haven't got the cheapest interest rates by any stretch of the imagination. I made a programme about payday loans that won a Royal Tenement Society Award called the Loan Ranger. And I took on the payday loan industry and I got Wonga shut down. They were charging 5,500% APR. And I saved some people in Scotland, actually, from, uh, from, from really getting really sucked into it. Um, but yeah, the, the problems I saw were incredible. So I thought something needs to be in the middle there that stops people going to, to pay their loans. So we try to do that sort of lending. We, we lend it so anything from sort of 4% up to like 12%, where the next thing after me is 5,000%, you know. But people can borrow off me. So if somebody goes on my website and fills in the forms and wants to buy a truck for work, or they want to buy a, a wagon, or they want to buy a forklift truck, or they want to buy a car to get to work, you know, whatever, they can go online anywhere in the country that can apply and if their credit rating's decent we will get them financed from one of our partners with, that we team up with that give the low rates two three four percent so if somebody can get it we'll get them the lowest one if somebody can't get it we'll try with 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 people who will give a little bit more and then once people get to a certain uh, amount with us and they've built the credit rating back up a lot of the time they can then swap back to, to to normal finance, which is, that's the future. If we can build people's credit ratings, I don't care. There's no fee for, for not uh, for not finishing a, 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 a loan with us. As long as you've paid your payments up to when you go, that's fine. Good luck to you. Yeah, it's hard, the credit rating, because I was a bad gambler back in the day, and I uh, fucked everything, phone bills, everything, and I'm building my credit back now. Everything's clean, everything's legit. I'm doing the right things, but... I know how hard that is to build credit that you've done years ago. It's there, the marker's there, and it's difficult to even get credit cards. I had to get phone contracts, I had to get shitty contracts, I had to get credit cards with interest rates so high. But listen, it all helps building the credit and trying to build a better life for yourself. See when you start, see when you do all that then, Dave, and life's going great and you're doing the bank of Dave, you're doing the right things. See, in the film that says you get charged, they throw a charge in because if you get a criminal record, you can't have a bank. How real is that? Well, I haven't got a criminal record, but they did try and uh, they did try and, and, and take me to court. They did try a lot of dirty tricks. You know, the uh, the big banks tried some very dirty tricks with me. Um, you know, they, they, they were sent investigative journalists. They sent people to my house. They sent, um, they, they did some bad things to me. You know, they were trying everything to get rid of me because I wasn't the right sort of chap. <laughs> As Hugh Bonneville says brilliantly in the <laughs> movie, you know, he's not the right sort of chap. You know, yeah. he's, he's not been to Oxford or Cambridge. He's, he's no qualifications and his parents worked in a mill, you know. So what? They worked hard, you know. Yeah, it's crazy that how controlled the world is when you go into the conspiracy theory looking at deep root and the kind of i don't really want to get into that it's not for the conversation but you know how dark it is how whoever's up there pulling the strings that it is fucking you would have tasted it like because you're such a good guy the journalists would have found somebody would have found somebody in the street would have found some yeah of course yeah put it in the front pages put it in the news. i've been in newspapers for, for for over a decade of mm -hmm. everything telly newspapers here and abroad films movies if i had done something bad They'd know about it. They tried. I haven't. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody's nobody's a saint, but I I tend to think that life gives you the reputation you deserve. At first, you can do daft things as a kid, but as you get older, you get the reputation you deserve. If you do the right thing, 
you will go down in history as doing the right thing, you know. And if you if you do what I was saying earlier about you you surround yourself with good people, you you pick up the things that the people around you you admire, pick up their traits, do more of that and less of the other, and you will find over time that you'll become a good person that will end up doing all right in life. And you, you don't have to go and start a bank. If if Bank of Day of the movie inspires people, not necessarily to open a bank or a financial institution, but just inspires you tomorrow morning to get up and uh, uh, have a look at a new job, maybe go for a promotion, maybe get a pay rise, maybe start a family, maybe maybe you want to start a little business, maybe you want to get a pub, maybe you want to start a cafe. Fantastic. If that inspires you to do that, then we've won. How many banks are in the UK? 344 or something, or over 300? There's, there's, there's thousands of banks in the, in the, in the UK. That, you know what? There's, there's two a day closing. So one closes this morning and one closes this afternoon, closing the branches. So how do you then get the foot in the door? How do you then make this possible? Because it already seems there. But how does it then, what is the next steps then? Like, are you already there? I'm, I'm not all the way with the license. We applied officially in 2017 stroke 2018. We were slowed down a bit with Brexit because the rules changed. Now we're not in Europe anymore. So the banking rules changed. So then we had to rip the paperwork up, start again. And then COVID came, which slowed us down a little bit. But this is a point. The big banks furloughed all their staff or lots of their staff. They also took a fortune off the government. They also got a fortune off the taxpayer. They took cash from, from, from all these different allowances that they were allowed to take it from. Burnley Savings and Loans didn't furlough a single person, didn't take a penny in benefits, didn't take a penny off the government, wasn't asked for, uh, we didn't ask for a penny and we didn't get a penny. We carried on operating all the way through, proving that we are fit and proper people to run a financial institution. And David H, David Enshaw, my right hand man, and all the team there, Every single one of them kept working. We work from home. We've got all the cloud security things in place. But David says something important. Every day you finish, you fill a pad in with a pencil and a piece of paper. And then we put that in the safe because that pad won't crash. No matter whatever else happens, we've got paper back up for every single deal that we've ever done. And that's important. What do you need to get a license? About 50 million quid and about 10 years of your life, and you, it's, it, nobody's ever done it. It's impossible. I mean, there is some digital licenses out there, but there's not, nobody's actually opened a high street bank. Because even Metro, the only one that did, is owned by the Americans. There's no, I'm the only British high street bank in the running at the minute that's trying to open on the high street. You there is a, nobody else. Have you ever seen a one, It's a Wonderful Life? Yeah, a few times. Yeah. Some some people have, have, have said that the movie, the Bank of Day of Netflix movie is very similar to that. Yeah, you can see the resemblance. It's one of the greatest films of all time. Like, from a man who just tried to do the right thing, the, the old man in the, the bank across the road kept trying to shut him down and he, he never ever he never ever bent or just, he just stayed just strong. Just keep going. Yeah. Do you feel as if it will come into existence? Yeah, of course it will. And when I get it, you know, I've got all the licenses to do what I'm doing today. When I get it, you know, I might just hang it on the wall and not even use it, but just get it, put it there, you know. Um, i got nothing to prove to nobody. Um, I've been incredibly lucky. I've been blessed in life with so many things that if it all went tomorrow, I've had a really good run. Um, and if we can pass a few things on, and I said to people in life, there's, there's four big rules in life, and rule number one is never lose money. Rule number two is never forget rule number one. And rule number three and four, the most important out of all of them, rule number three is never give up. And rule number four, the most important one of all, is everybody that's watching and listening to your podcast. Rule number four is never, ever give up. And if you do that, you'll succeed. See, when you've got the Netflix films out, you've got the books, you're in all the TV stations, morning telly, I've never seen somebody that's been on so much fucking morning telly as yourself. Like, does that damage your chances of getting the license for a bank or does it enhance that? Well, to a certain degree, you need media uh, to be protected. For me to be protected, I need to be in the media just in case, you know, the big banks or the big organisations come for me. You know, you need to have a certain amount of uh, of media coverage. Um, I, I met the guy in the documentary because um, next Friday, 
uh, Friday the 24th, the Netflix documentary is out, which is exactly what I did in the Bank of Dave. So it shows the actual documentaries of what led up to the Bank of Dave movie. Uh, they've been remastered, they've been digitised, they're in 4K, um, there's been some things added to it, uh, and we're really excited about that. That's actual you know, the team and what happened for real. So that'll get sent to everybody that's watched the movie on the platform and anybody that hasn't watched the movie can watch the documentary and then perhaps watch the movie after if they want to. But it'll, anybody that's got Netflix from the 24th of March will be able to watch the actual documentary series. Why did they not release that before the film? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I in a way, I'm glad they didn't because the movie... Um, there's a lot of people that watch movies that don't watch documentaries. Um, there's, there's more people watch movies than anything else. So if you've watched a movie about something and you've enjoyed it, we were so lucky it hit number one. Um, the people that have watched it now might want to watch the documentary. So that's really cool that it's got an audience now, um, uh, that, that maybe it might not have had the same audience before. Um, Netflix have been wonderful to work with. Um, they really are cool. You know, when I said to them, I want the premiere to be in Burnley, you know, it's the first premiere ever held outside London in history. There's never, ever been a movie premiere in, in, uh, outside London. There's never been a movie premiere in Burnley, <laughs> but that didn't take a lot of Googling to find out. <laughs> and all these people came up from Netflix, you know, from all over and the stars came from the movie and the local people that took part in the movie were there and the, everybody from Burnley Savings Loans, the Bank of Dave were there and all the people we've helped and the businesses all came and the local butchers there, Hafner's Pies, he he's made us a pie, a special pie and peas for the for the movie and it was just really special, really, really special. I turned up in one of my buses, you know, uh, and it was just really cool. And it made headlines all over the world that this, this premiere, it was in Burnley, uh, center of the universe. And, uh, I just, that, that was, that was a big proud moment that when, when everybody were there and my friends and family and, and, and were there. And I just thought, you know what? It, that's cool. That's really cool. What was your proudest moment? One of my most surreal moments is, um, is definitely when we were filming, um, Def Leppard in the could Def Leppard take part in the movie. And when we called them to ask them to be in it and they said, yes, I just thought, wow. And they flew over specially to film the concert. And, uh, I remember being in the studio with them filming part of the concert and I'm looking up at this screen, uh, that had been put up for the blue, you know, the blue screen, uh, that they do the, uh, special effects on and Def Leppard were there for real on the stage. And, uh, I just had a chat to them. And there they were, they were walking through the, uh, through the studio and up onto this thing. And then Rory, who plays me in the movie, our bond, Rory Kinnear, he stood up on, onto the stage with them and started singing with them. And I just looked at that thinking, wow, you know, that's that just happened. And that was very surreal. Um, one of the proudest moments, um, has to be family and friends. Um, I love being around family and friends. Um, I love the Bank of Dave dearly. I would never ever sell it under any circumstances, ever. There's no money, there's not in the number, ever. Um, and it has to stand there forever after I've gone. Um, my money will be left in uh, in perpetuity to be able to fund the charities and the, the, the business uh, forever, uh, so it lives on forever, to show that if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. How did the movie come about, Dave? I got a phone call about two years ago from a guy called uh, Piers Ashworth who wrote Mission Impossible for Tom Cruise. Uh, he was a writer. And uh, he was out having dinner in Hollywood with the guy that voiced over the original Banker Dave documentary series, which is coming out on the 24th. And uh, this, this voiceover guy has gone out to America and he, he's got really big in the world of voiceovers. And he's a big star out there with it now on all the big uh, movies and films. So they're having dinner. And Piers said to him, said, we're looking for a feel-good movie in, from Britain. You know, do you know anybody? And he said, yeah, Dave. And he said, Dave who? What do you mean, Dave who? <laughs> Dave from Burnley. <laughs> so he, he got me books, he read me book, he got me documentaries and watched them. And he watched all the programs that I've made 
before he contacted me. He'd done his own work properly. And he rang me. He said, my name's Piers Ashworth. I make Hollywood movies. And I'd like to make a movie about your life. And I said, well, you better get yourself to Burnley again. And let's uh, let's have a chat, you know. And, uh, and that's how it all started. I'm surprised I never got Tom Cruise to play your part, Dave. Well, do you know what? I, he, he's friends with Tom. And I did say to him, you know, um, could we get Tom to play me? But he did say that it just looked too alike because me and Tom are like that. <laughs> and it just looked too like me. So we needed to get somebody that uh, that didn't just, because me and Tom are like twins. <laughs> but he did flick through his phone, press T, and Tom Cruise come up on a telephone number. And that's cool to have Tom Cruise in yeah. the phone. You know, and then mine rang and it was Mrs. F, whinging that I was late from the <laughs> <laughs> Back to her fast. <laughs> How was it watching the movie? Because a great actor, like, like great, the girl from out, uh, Afterlife. Yeah, like, Jo Hartley, she's, she's wonderful. A real and she's lovely. Character. And she, she was talking to us yesterday, you know, she's lovely and she stayed in touch with Nikki and they'd become friends. Um, she's lovely. Um, she's done loads of movies. Um, and obviously a lot of things with Ricky Gervais. And then you've got Phoebe Denever, the leading lady, who out of Bridgerton, Netflix's biggest hit with 400 million views. She flew in specially from LA to Burnley that day into Manchester Airport. We picked her up and she went straight to Burnley Market where we were filming. So one minute she's in LA on the set of Bridgerton. The next thing she's in Burnley Market having a chip butty with me, you know. So that, I think that... Uh, that were a bit of a culture shock <laughs> but she was she was great fun you know and Hugh Bonneville I I asked you to be in the movie and I have a lovely story here um, I was at an awards getting a, an award a very lucky and got a, a TV award for one of my documentaries and I was at the bar after and uh, Nikki and I was uh, were having a drink and Hugh Bonneville walking towards us and uh, I thought he's coming towards us coming towards us and I said to Nikki I said that's Hugh Bonneville and you know, from all the big movies. And he, uh, he come up to me, he said, excuse me, Dave, he said, my name's Hugh and I'm an actor. Would you mind terribly if I had my picture took with you? And I thought, wow. So I had my picture took with him. And uh, from that day, we become friends. And then when the movie was, uh, was being talked about, I rang him and I said, I'd love you to pay one of the bankers in the movie. Of course I would, Dave, you know. And he did, and he was brilliant. And he is just so special and, um, yeah, fantastic. That's life's surreal in, in lots of ways. But I think that's your character. I can see you're a good guy. It's leaving an impression on somebody where you, you walk away from and they don't think you're a dick, which is important, especially in day, today's society. Everybody's got an agenda. Everybody's out for themselves. Listen, we've got to survive. Yeah. We want to make money. We want to help people. We want to do the right things. But like I say, it's leaving an impression when people go, I like him. So eventually, if you ever do come, need, not need anything but speak to them two or three years, people will jump over fucking mountains for you. And that's the most important thing in life. That like you don't get this far with, with just saying that there's plenty of dicks out there that have got far in life of being envious and greedy. But your character and your nature, everybody you seem to come in contact with, you seem to leave a good impression. How important is that for you? Well, to be honest, once you've got all the things in life that you want and need, you know, you've you've got a good partner, you've got a good family, and and and, and touch wood, you, you 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 get a decent health. My dad used to say, every day you get up, lad, and you don't feel the wood sides, you're having a good day. You know, get both feet on the ground and try hard. Um, and once you've got all the things you want and all the things you need, then you've got to then look for something else. And if you can make a difference, I promise anybody that's watching this program. Anybody that's watching this, if you can make a difference, however, whether it's volunteering your time, whether it's giving some money, whether it's going doing something, whether it's starting a business, whether it's employing people, whether it's doing something that's bonkers, that's out there, that's going to help, you know, society. I said to my kids, look, you can do anything, but you can't do nothing. I'm going to give a big part of my net worth away. I'm not going to leave it to the next generations. They're going to have enough to do anything, but not enough to do nothing. And... Like I say, one's a frontline police officer and one works with animals in an animal charity. And I said to him, the things you want to be doing are things that make you want to get up in the morning. And once you've got the things that you want, then that's all you've got left. You know, and your reputation, as I said to, to, to the kids, the reputation takes a lifetime to get and seconds to lose. So if you can do something that's going to make a difference, you'll get such a kick out of that. You really will. And it's not until you start doing it until you start seeing it. Were you nervous when the film came out? Were you kind of 
being put out there in the limelight to the masses that not damaged your reputation, but you're putting yourself out there how you are as a character. It was their nerves. I'd spoke such a lot to the team at Netflix and they were, when I said to them, I want to do it in Burnley, they said, let's make it happen. And I said, I want to film in the market. I want to film at the Bank of Dave. I want to film in, in the train station. I want to film, I want to film where it happened. And they said, we'll make that happen. And I got such a lot of assurities that, that they were going to do the best they can. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's lots of artistic um, license in it. That's what movies are all about. Do you, do you know what? And Def Leppard and, and all the rest of it. But you know, that actually happened now because it was in the movie. It actually happened for real because we did it in the movie to make it happen for real. So that's part of life now. And you know, the thing about movies is Superman can't fly either, but it was a good film. And that's what I said to people. It's good. It's a good film. It's based on a true story. And if it just inspires people to do something different or to take that next step, then we've won. What about for kids that being a successful man? Like how important is it not to spoil your kids where they've constantly got anything they want and to keep them like if one's a working in the police and one's working with animals like it's clear that they're not spoiled and living off daddy's money like how important is it not to spoil kids it's tremendously important not to spoil give them enough to do anything but not enough to do nothing i have a lot of friends who are very wealthy who have given their kids everything and it's just ruined them absolutely ruined them you know um you've got to let kids be kids don't you know None of mine have gone to private education, neither has my grandchildren. I don't agree with it. I think you can get good schools, be around real people in good schools uh, without needing private education. If you can afford private education, good luck to you, no problem. I just think that there's some good schools out there and being mixed with real people makes a real difference and, and, and creates the, 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 the person around that. Is that because of your own background, where you've came from, you understand that you don't need to be private schools, expensive schools to make something of your life? Yeah, I, I mean, if people want to go to college or university and get lots of qualifications, fantastic. We need doctors, we need people to do that. But not everybody can do that. Not everybody's capable of doing that. Not everybody's got the money to do that. Not, you know, I grew up in, in one of the toughest parts of the country. You know, not everybody gets them sort of opportunities. What I try and get across is for the kids that don't get them opportunities, the ones that do good luck, get as many qualifications as you can, fantastic. You know, you're going to have a real good go at life that way. But the ones that can't or don't get them opportunities, then there is another way. Um, and I'm living proof there's another way. Um, you know, the teachers thought I was going to be a, just a bomber or a loser. Um, and there is another way. Uh, and if you, if you put your mind to it, you genuinely can achieve anything. Was there ever a day you felt important, that you felt that you were achieving your things like teachers thinking you're not good enough or never amount to anything, the women in the chip shop taking back your chips. Was there ever a moment you walked down the street and thought, do you know what, I'm living it, I'm doing it, I'm, a, I'm, I'm setting out everything and I'm fucking achieving it. Like, was there ever a moment or a day still where not, it made sense? Still not today, still not today. I've just been to the Daily Mirror this morning. Um, I'm with ITV this afternoon. I'm, I'm working with you with the biggest podcast in the country. Um, you know, I'll walk out of here just the same guy that walked in and I'll I'll be with our TV this afternoon. I'll we'll go home, maybe late tonight if I manage to get the last train uh, or tomorrow morning. And, um, you know, I'll go and sit with the lads who are valeting the buses and eat toast with them. Um, you've got to stay grounded. You know, I, I think once, if you ever get to the point where you think you've done it all, then, then you know, maybe it's time, you know, to, 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 to think of something new to do because, uh, and I think I'd deteriorate really quickly if I thought I'd, I'd, I'd done it. Yeah, because you get people who've done, maybe done a movie or wrote a song and they think they're the bollocks and they think they've achieved everything and accomplished everything. You're living proof that you need to keep working. You Just need keep to going. keep hustling. Like, how, how do you then find balance from everything that you're doing, everything that you're working on, travelling around the world, doing films, books, documentaries? Like, how do you find balance? Like, what... I know you use helicopters when you feel it free or at ease. Like when do you feel that you can juggle something if you're having that day and then try to take your mind off things? Is it just the helicopter completely or have you got other things in place where you can relax a bit more? Um, me, and, me and Nikki, my wife, we go and walk our Jack Russell on the beach. Um, 
we uh, we fly to places and go and land on top of mountains and go walking. Um, we spend uh, a lot of time um, walking and and uh, just getting away from everything really you know i don't do a lot of holidays because i'm usually working um but uh, at some point i do want to go on a holiday more definitely um but hopefully that i'll get the chance in the future my dad says you get three score a year and ten and anything after that's a bonus which means you get to seven yeah. and if that's that's a bonus so if i get past three score a year and ten i'm going to start going on holidays <laughs> yeah, it's just, but do you think you can relax you on a holiday or do you constantly thinking about the next move <sighs> i'm always getting phone calls i'm always doing things and but do you know what you go on holiday you meet some people you can have the crack and uh, i don't know i just there's always something interesting like i'm going out to 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 publicize the movie in america the movie's being released on in cinemas in america uh, and in australia and then it's going to netflix after uh that was the deal that was done uh, so i'm going out to america i'll go across the states meeting people in the different states and going on with james corden and all the, the talk shows there out there and chatting about the movie and i'll meet loads of interesting people um and nikki might come out for a couple of days and she might fly back home um it and that'll be like holiday. <laughs> so I'll say, look, you've been. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fucking unbelievable what you've done, Dave. It is, it's unbelievable, mate. You should be proud and proud of you. It's, it's class to see. Like, I love people winning. I love people succeeding. Because in my mind, I think if you can do it, I can do it. I'm not going to go down the same route as you. I just want to interview people and be the biggest on the planet. But I just... I find it motivational that people can stay humble, stay grounded, because there's so much greed out there. There's so much wealth. There's wealth there for everybody. If you've got the right patterns and right tools and techniques to then put things into place to then believe in yourself. It's took me five years to create everything I've created, but I believe my platform's built and I'm only getting started. I never find, I'm talking about myself here, sorry, but I never find the, the fulfillment or the enjoyment that I can enjoy it yet because I feel as if there's just so much more to go. But do you feel that as well? Like everything, the people would be happy with, one percent of what you have but you've do you ever feel as if you've got so much more to go that that's why you can't switch off well there's always another there's always another avenue there's always another book uh to read or there's always another person to meet and tomorrow morning you never you never know if that's going to be that bus opportunity do you remember the one I told you about where they, you, you, when you grab them opportunities they make such a difference in life where you get that first bus and then become the biggest supplier of buses you never know tomorrow what's going to come there might be something else tomorrow that then maybe you get to meet somebody else interesting i, I had a guy a, a, um the guy um the nobel peace prize winner muhammad yusuf who built the green mean bank and uh, his big friends were warren buffy and he traveled thousands of miles to meet me traveled three and a half thousand miles just to meet me and chat to me and i really found that touching and then I met the uh, former uh, president of South Africa, who also has a Nobel Peace Prize, who's a winner. Uh, sorry, he was um, a friend of uh, Muhammad Yusuf. Um, and he was talking about Nelson Mandela uh, and uh, he, he helped release Nelson. And he was so interesting to talk to. And he really loved the idea of the Bank of Dave. And what the Bank of Dave's done is open doors it's only tiny, it's tiny. We've lent over 30 million pound out, but it's tiny compared to, to the big institutions. But the brand and the outreach of it, where other people can be inspired to do things, that's the thing I like the most. And you know, it, it opens doors for me to be able to talk to important people, and then I can learn things and I can maybe take, take that and, and teach other people what I can learn from these people. Mm -hmm. It's mad that you're going to America. Why did they not release it in the cinemas here? The only cinema release it got was the premiere, which were the first one. Remember, Netflix doesn't do cinema release. Mm. And they we they did it. They, 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 they bust all the rules for me to be able to have a premiere in Burnley, at, at the real cinema in Burnley. Uh, we're pie and peas. You must have. Felt like <laughs> a, a real movie. Did you feel like a movie star? Yeah. Well, it was. Uh, I mean, the movie stars, the uh, Rory and Joe and, and the rest of them. But um, I definitely felt a bit special. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so wonderful to see friends and family there and, and everybody come and, and everybody were part of it. Yeah. For anybody that's in debt, Dave, what advice would you have for them? Uh, the thing is, there's a lot of help out there for debt if you know where to look. There's Cab C A B. If you Google that. You can look at how how they can help uh, the citizens uh, the citizens advice bureau. Um, go and see somebody. Start the process. Speak 
to somebody. Speak to friends, family, and then go and see the Citizens Advice Bureau. I speak to them quite a lot, the CAB, um, and I, I get information off them that I can pass on to people. Um, they're really, really good, and they've got lots of things that they can tell you what to do, and you can be able to, to really manage your payments. Don't drown in the debt. Do something about it. And the first thing tomorrow morning after you've watched this, if you're in debt, go and see Citizens Advice Bureau and tell them Dave sent you. What's the best advice you've ever received? My dad. My dad would say, whatever you're going to do, lad, do it now. Because there'll be a time when you can't. You know, I remember he, he, uh, he always said to me, you know, every day you wake up, you're not feeling the wood sides. You're having a good day. And at his funeral... Um, I stood up and said a few words and I said at the end, I said, hey, your dad, you're feeling wood sides today and he was there and, and uh, he brought a tear to me eye and I don't cry. I never cry and that brought a tear to me eye. So whatever you're going to do, do it now because there'll be a time when you can't. How much does your dad play a big part in your life to still keep you grounded now? Oh, he's watching now, yeah. Have the courage to follow your dreams, that's what he'd say. Yeah, that's important, isn't it? Yeah. Do you feel as if, like, going forward for the future, that like, how, how, what, what, what can you do, man? How, like, how, where can you go? Like, well, you've ticked all the boxes, you've won awards, you've got films, you've got books, documentaries. <laughs> you're going to, I believe, you'll get the license to have the first bank in the hundred. Is it hundred and twenty years? Yeah. Like, it's fucking madness. Like, it's madness. Kid from Burnley. Like, your dad would be proud, and I, I believe in energies. I believe in spirits. I believe we are protected. I believe. Like people are here guiding us, and I believe if you're a good soul, you are protected. Don't yeah, you? I, I, I do. I think if you do good things, good things will happen to you. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of karma goes on. Um, I find that I can get a, a real kick out of doing something good for somebody, especially somebody that perhaps can't pay you back. Like you know, a, a, a young girl wrote to me to say thank you for for providing the food um, for the school, and she's saying she's now she's now eating every morning. And uh, I can't tell you what that's worth, receiving letters like that. Uh, and I'll send you a copy of the letter so you can put it on, on the website when, when they put the uh, podcast on. And then other people can read it too. Because I get a kick out of that far more than some politician or big banker come in saying, I'll give you this, that and the other money wise. But I don't care what, what the politicians uh, think or say, and I don't care what the bankers say. I'm not a politician. I'm very bipartisan. I don't care who's in, as long as they create a net for people to fall on that bounces them back into society because it's so unfair out there at the minute. Yeah, Where do you go forward for the future, Dave? What's the plans? Um, I think the thing is, the, the movie's been been such a, a big hit and, and, and you know I didn't realise what, what had come from that. And I've got two or three really big balls in the air that are floating there at the minute that's come from the movie. And if one of those falls, wow. So, do you know what? Watch this space. I'll come on and tell you when one falls. Can't wait for it, brother. <laughs> but listen, mate, I can... Good guy, mate. I've, sometimes interviews drain me, but I feel good after this one. Like, it's good to have you on and good for people to see what can be done. It's good to see where you've came from, to what you're achieving now, to what you keep achieving, to have big dreams and big ambitions and to have a strong family life, to raise good kids, to have a good missus and to try and just juggle the life of madness and, and kind of enjoy it along the way that for anybody that's maybe struggling now dave what advice would you have for them remember rule number three and rule number four that i said earlier rule number three is never give up and rule number four the most important thing of all that i've said all today and if if the viewers uh, can take something away rule number four is never ever give up James, it's been a pleasure. Dave, listen, absolute pleasure. I wish you nothing but more success in the future, and I look forward to seeing what you do. Thank you very God much. God bless you.